All right, welcome to today's webinar, Transforming Food Culture to Transform Our World, a webinar brought to you by SAFSF, Grace Communications Foundation, and Food Culture Collective, formerly known as Real Food, Real Stories. Please join us now in the future with a lovely stop motion video from Food Culture Collective. Food is culture. It tells the story of who we are in the seeds we sow and the tables we set. The story of food is the story of us. It's the story of who we're becoming. Mamang, you said when you journeyed here all those years ago, you lost your appetite. You couldn't be hungry when the stairs of strangers were so sour. Well, 40 new neighbors joined our block party today. 5,000 miles and a hurricane between them and home. New smells came from our kitchens and we celebrated them because this is how our neighborhood tastes now. This is where we all belong. I'm saving the best of the season for you. Remember dad used to say he was only allowed to eat the drops since any perfect peach eaten was a dollar lost? Back when the farm's success was tied to the consumer, not the community. But us, nourished by the bruised and the beautiful, pleasures were always there to be shared. Can you believe it's been a decade since y'all sat me down and said, Mimi, you cared for us. Now it's our turn. How do you want to savor your wrinkled years? You know, my parents passed on alone. 40 years in restaurants, never a day off. But now my age is welcomed as a gift, not a burden. Now you tend my garden. Are you hungry for a future that nourishes our collective healing, liberation, and joy? At Food Culture Collective, we're working to reclaim and reimagine the stories that feed our world and shape our relationships. Together, we can democratize food culture and seed an irresistible future. Hi, everyone. My name is Jovita. I also go by Joe. You'll hear people refer to me that way. And I am the director and steward of Food Culture Collective. And I'm here today with some friends who do really powerful cultural work, who I'm excited for you to meet. Fabiola Santiago is a Zapotec indigenous cultural worker who expresses her love for her culture through various mediums, including cooking, writing, speaking, and imagining a future in which Native Oaxacans have cultural agency and economic security. Fabiola, your work reminds us that there are people, histories, and cultures behind trendy foods and beverages like mezcal, and that when we forget that, we lose something, we lose something important and meaningful. Would you share with us how you came to do the work that you do? What motivates you to do it and the future that you hope it makes possible? Uh, as Joe mentioned, I'm from a Zapotec woman from Oaxaca, Mexico. I was born here and migrated to the US when I was about six years old. My parents used to make mezcal, and so did my grandparents and great-grandparents. We are from a pueblo, a town, a village called Santiago Matatlan, and it is considered the world's capital of mezcal. Some of you on this call may have heard or drank or tried mezcal, which is trending very heavily in the United States. In fact, 75%, 75 to 90% of the mezcal that is produced here in Oaxaca is for export. And that has a lot of implications. And I learned or first tried mezcal outside of my culture in 2012 at a very hipstery bar in downtown Los Angeles a couple months or so after I got my green card because when we migrated, I was undocumented. And I felt both pride in seeing this cultural spirit be at a, at a bar and also some hesitation and some, some questions around that and how it was being introduced into the US market. And I went to this bar and it was an awful experience to say the least um, because of the way that it was presented. And quite simply for me was that I didn't get the service that I think I deserved. And it could be for a host of reasons. My perception is that I felt discriminated against. And 
in racial justice work and in public health work, we know that perceived discrimination or racism or uh, sexism is real, whether um, as long as it's perceived, it, it's real. Um, so I ignore that industry altogether, didn't want to have anything to do with it and put that away. Then I moved to the Bay Area and I worked on a wage theft campaign to curb wage theft in the state of California. The people who experience wage theft the most are low wage working people, immigrants and women and folks of color. Um, after I completed this uh, research project to curb wage theft in the state of California, which did pass into law, um, I was also involved in a local campaign where a Mexican Mexican owned restaurant um, was um, stole wages from a Oaxaqueña, an uh, indigenous Oaxacan woman, her recipes and her um, her wages. And that restaurant was not held accountable. And I think that was the second moment in this trajectory where that anger and that um, fury really just sparked. I didn't know what to do at the time either, so I continued working in public health and doing research to improve health inequities. Um, and then again in 2018, when my little one was about five months old, um, we were renting a single family unit and the landlord um, had to ask us to move out so that her family members can move in. So, and at this point, because motherhood is an incredibly important responsibility for me, um, I decided not to work for that first year. So what I did instead, and that's my little one knocking in case <laughs> any of you can hear that knock. Um, so what I did instead was I asked a friend if he was willing to move with the family and that I would cook Oaxacan food. Um, and my friend tried that food and said, why are you not having, like, why, why, why don't you have a restaurant or why don't you make this professionally? And he gave me a bunch of resources I started doing pop-ups, cooking on Sundays, applied to La Cocina, was accepted to the food incubator, incubator program um, to launch a restaurant and mezcal bar, mezcaleria. But the pandemic hit and I took a big pause, came back to Oaxaca and have expanded the concept to include cultural education and preservation. So that's kind of the gist of it. Um, I look forward to sharing a little bit more details around that concept and how to collaborate and how to do this together because it is um, coming from a systems of, systems change approach, uh, the work that I'm doing with New Oaxaca. Thank you so much, Fabiola. Um, and then we also have with us today, Aisha Schillingford, who is an anti-disciplinary artist, world builder, designer and cultural strategist who is originally from Trinidad and Tobago. Aisha, your aesthetic is full of joyful abundance, paired with provocative questions that invite us to activate radical imagination, uh, to imagine and, and imagine ourselves in a world where Black people are flourishing and joyful and thriving. Um, can you tell us how you came to do the work that you do and the stories and futures that it makes possible? Thank you. Um, it's really nice to hear you describe the work that way it really resonates. Um, yeah, I I sort of, it's a long, a bit of a long journey, but to summarize it, I was a community organizer and, and I would say movement builder for about 20, years. I started my journey in Trinidad, um, working with uh, a consulting firm that was, as a research assistant, a consulting firm that was doing watershed development work in six watersheds across the country, um, getting to meet people um, who lived and worked in those watersheds and to ask them questions about how they wanted their, their villages and neighborhoods to look in the future um, and essentially facilitate a collaborative process between those communities and the government that was responsible for developing the watersheds um, in various ways, including agriculture, um, water resource uh, stewardship and so on. Um, and just really fell in love with the idea of working with communities to 
build the power to shape their, their futures and approached that work um, for a long time through the lens of community organizing. So engaging communities, bringing them into relationship with each other um, and asking beautiful questions about what they want the future to look like. Um, and did that with the Muslim community in Boston, Massachusetts for a long time, develop, helped to develop a cultural center there that's I think the largest Muslim cultural center on the East Coast. Um, and in, in the course of doing that work, um, went to social work school and got involved with uh, domestic violence prevention organizing, um, working in the neighborhood, Dorchester neighborhood of Boston, um, again, bringing communities together um, around um, kitchen table conversations to really shift taboos around the ways in which um, violence impacts their lives so that people could feel connected and be able to rely on community um, when incidents of violence um, did occur and, and sort of uh, collectively develop transformative ways for approaching um, intimate partner violence. Um, after a while, I started to feel that I can't just care about like one issue. Um, and I was like, you know, I was just like too passionate about too many things and I wanted to understand how I could impact a whole. And I think that's when I uh, sort of discovered movement building and, and sort of uh, transformation as a frame um, and uh, did some work with the New Economy Coalition working on cooperative development and um, racial and economic justice within the, what was called the new, new economy movement or new economy space. So at the intersection of climate justice, um, democracy, um, and uh, economic justice. Um, and, um, you know, found myself eventually at Movement Strategy Center, which is where Joe and I met and had the opportunity to collaborate for a long time and really um, dove into this idea of um, uh, worldview shift, um, shifting our systems, transforming our systems, um, and was really enamored and, and sort of struck by the intersection between transforming ourselves to transform the world. Um, eventually, um, you know, maybe through some of the work that we engaged in together, started really thinking about my own purpose and how to locate myself um, inside of all of these larger questions of change and transformation and realized that I was starting to hear if even faintly a calling towards um, more creativity and making and, and art and so on um, as part of my practices around transformation um, and learned mechanisms for listening to those to that calling um, mechanisms like meditation and embodiment and so on and um, eventually um, was supported in, in many different ways to leap towards um, making and creating art uh, and so on and so started to work full time with with the collective that I had been part of Intelligent Mischief, um, which is now a creative studio um, that unleashes black imagination to shape the future. Um, so we create art, entertainment, experiences, popular culture, content, basically whatever we think is appropriate to um, catalyze bold imagination around what futures are, are possible. Thank you so much, Aisha. Um, so uh, we wanted to start with sharing personal story because um, that is really how our understanding with Food Culture Collective, our understanding of cultural strategy grew is uh, through the work of Real Food, Real Stories of gathering people together to hear personal stories of of people who are shaping the world through food. Uh, we didn't quite know that that's what we were doing at the time, but when uh, the pandemic hit and, and um, we were faced with some big changes along with the rest of the world, and we started doing some soul searching about what, what is it that we really have to offer and what do our communities need um, from us? What do we have to offer our communities? And um, we came to understand that all of these stories uh, of people 
who are growing and, and making and sharing food in different ways, that there is value embedded in those stories, that there's a whole worldview, there's a, a deeper collective story, a way of understanding ourselves, our relationships, and our world. And um, that story creates experiences that through sharing story, the exchange of listening and sharing that 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 activates our our cultural experience of um, of worldviews and of deeper narratives. And so we started um, reviewing and dialoguing with our community to find the identify and synthesize what are the deeper narratives that we have heard from our community members who are doing values-based purposeful work in food who are really, as I said, shaping the world through food. Um, and we, we discovered some common themes um, that, that we'll share with, with you in a bit um, and realized that that we could understand our work as intentionally um, being a part of a, a bigger ecosystem, a bigger movement of people who are uh, sh using culture to shape culture because culture shapes everything that humans do, including uh, systems, policies, economies, and that if we, um, can shift to cultural values that affirm life, that support um, humans and all of the all of the beings and ecosystems that support our lives. That um, we will discover new policies, new technologies, new ways of being in relationship and exchange. Um, that will also align with those cultural values. So we're going to have a, a little bit of dialogue here um, between Fabiola, Aisha, and, and myself. And I'm going to ask my colleague, Chizue, to uh, join and, and help us with that. Thanks so much, Jovita. And thank you to Fabiola and Aisha for joining us. I, um, like Joe said, my name is Shizue Roshidachi, she, her pronouns, and I am the narrative strategist at Food Culture Collective. And I'm so excited to be facilitating this conversation between people that I consider just electric folks, um, working both uh, specifically in food and in ways that shape the culture that leads into um, all the food work that we do. Um, but before we jump into our first really juicy question, I just wanted to take a step back um, to get us all on the same page. I think um, I've been working in food and in the nonprofit food world for over a decade. And it was probably just like, frankly, when I got this job a couple of years ago that I heard the term narrative strategy and I had never heard it before. And it was only after diving into it, I realized that it's something I've been practicing for um, many years. But narrative strategy, I think, is very buzzy right now. Like you're hearing it more than ever before, um, but it's not new. Narrative strategy is just a fancy way of saying storytelling with purpose. Um, I think narrative strategy as a term is, is how we're trying to help witness and legitimize storytelling um, with some fancy jargon uh, in many spaces. We're seeing it a lot in like intentional media development. Um, and it's starting to tiptoe into food. And I think that's really essential, right? Because food systems transformation um, can't happen without cultural transformation because systems don't live in vacuums, right? They're an expression of the culture that underpins them, which in, in this country that we live in or I live in, I don't know where everyone's calling in here from, um, are you know, current food system is, is rooted in the history of chattel slavery and colonization and, and our dominant um, white supremacy culture. And so un unless we shift that culture, the soup we swim in, um, we limit the bounds of our imagination of, of what's possible. You know, I think um, in the same way that uh, you, you don't want to fix a problem downstream, right? You have to move to the source. And I think culture is the source. 
And it's actually a really expedient way to shift um, systems um, because culture moves faster than policy and often much more intelligently. Um, and I think that that's a powerful connecting moment to be like, why, why is narrative strategy part of food systems work? Um, it's because food systems work doesn't happen without cultural transformation work. Um, there is no culture without food. There is no culture without, without change. Um, I have just a couple visual references that I wanted to weave in here. Um, we're gonna be sharing out the slides after this. Um, so you can take a deeper dive at that point. Um, I'm gonna go kind of cursory. And also I would invite anyone, um, if you have any questions emerging, we will have a Q&A portion at the end, um, but feel free to drop those questions as they emerge into the chat um, and we will lift them back up. So this is an analogy um, that at Food Culture Collective we like to share, because I think it's helpful for folks new to thinking about how does storytelling um, move into culture change um, and how do we scaffold from stories to culture change. This framework builds upon um, a conversation about cultural strategy that Chang, Man and Potts published in Medium a couple of years back who are all um, narrative strategist practic practitioners. Um, but I think what's, what's useful here is the metaphor that you know, stories are our seeds. They're individual, um, they're evocative, they can inspire, they can witness, um, they can create connections, um, but inherently they're, they're a story that stands alone, right? Narratives are our fields. So it's where these stories are planted in community to layer and create a deeper meaning. So just in the same way that a carrot seed alone is a carrot, right? A carrot next to a tomato plant, next to green beans becomes a garden or um, there's an apple tree standing alone and next to a peach tree becomes an orchard, right? So we need many plants to shape and define these spaces that we work in. And culture then is our ecosystem. It's our landscape. It's where all of these narratives, all these fields we have tended to and cultivated intentionally um, then become expressed in the world that surrounds us. And so uh, when we change our stories, we change our perception of the world around us and what we're able then to create. Do you wanna to move to the next slide, Erin? Um, so I think, as I was noting before, you know, right now the story of food is really rooted in our history um, in a story of extraction and exploitation. And I think a lot of us can get stuck there of like, yeah, we wanna change that, but how do we feed something intentionally that doesn't just oppose that, right? We don't wanna just create a reactionary narrative strategy. We want to feed something powerful that drives us in the other direction. Um, so as Joe was mentioning, uh, Real Food Real Stories uh, as a storytelling organization uh, had all of these uh, storytelling events and out of that came the narrative framework that now undergirds Food Culture Collective's work. And I just wanted to offer a glimpse here of what do we mean by sort of narratives that can support our collective healing and transformation and liberation. So narratives like food is relational, we all deserve a home, we all belong to the land, nourishment is a right of all people, all bodies, care is the essence of labor, and together we have what we need to flourish. So in a landscape that, you know, in food spaces, you hear a lot of driving around scarcity, those pieces, um, these, are, these are narratives that can interrupt that. Next slide. Um, I know a lot of you might be familiar with this because I know SAFSF has done some programming around this, which is great. Um, but for those who are new, this is just an image from Allison Conrad that was published in a policy, um, uh, in a paper from Duke Sanford's World Policy Food Center um, that was really looking at, you know, what is the narrative strategy at play in a lot of the messaging that we get in nonprofit food spaces. Um, so just because you don't think you're operating with a narrative strategy doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It often just means we're not intentional about it. So if you see on the left side, those are some of those narratives of white supremacy popping up, individualism, paternalism, neoliberalism, expressing themselves in food systems narratives like vote with your fork, communities can't take care of themselves, bootstrapping, um, a lot of messaging and stories that I think many of us working in food spaces have probably um, brushed up against um, or bristled against. Next slide. And so just as I was saying, like sometimes it's hard to say, well, I don't wanna move in reaction. I don't want an anti-paternalism message. How do we move towards something positive? 
um, using the narrative framework that Food Culture Collective has as an example of how we can root then in values in a narrative strategy tied to mutualism, belonging, and reciprocity, just as an example, um, to think about what are the narratives, not that we're just making up, right, that are already existing all around us that we need to listen for, cultivate intentionally, um, and organize around so that our systems, practices, behaviors are then shaped around an imagination of a world where all of these things are considered true. Not that food is scarce, but that it is an abundant. Um, not that um, only some people deserve certain things, right? That we, that we all do. Um, last slide. And I just wanted to share here, this is a glimpse into the beautiful work Aisha has been doing in Intelligent Mischief. Um, some of the collages that I think seed really intentional uh, narratives here that are important in, in imagining um, what our food system can look like, what our world can look like. Um, the middle one actually draws from Food Culture Collective's vision statement. Um, we dare to dream of a future shaped by care for the land, water, and peoples to which we belong. Um, but I also wanted to weave in the one on your far right because I think it really speaks to some of the key narratives um, that I hear in the work that you're doing, Fabiola. Um, and we can close down the slides. That was a little bit of a spiely background, um, but the intention there is, is is to then kick it back to both, um, maybe I'll, I'll tag you in first, Aisha, but um, I'd love to hear from, from you all, you know, given the collective existential crisis that we're facing, you know, we're talking about climate change, we're talking about corporate control of living systems, land grabs, profiteering, escalating social crises, right? It's like one after another um, feeling like hit by this whirlwind. You know, given that collective crisis, what are the, implications or possibilities when we organize around values of care and reciprocity or belonging and mutualism and and maybe specifically like how is an intentional narrative strategy rooted in those irresistible values um, essential to transforming our relationships to to food land and and each other and yeah so, um Aisha I'd love to I'd love to pick your brain first Oh, wow. Um, I think what comes to mind, or if I was to relate the question like to the work that we do, I think one of the things we are inviting is um, we're trying to create like a, a space and an invitation for people who are feeling called to create new systems, even as um, some of our existing systems are crumbling um you know recognizing that there's a there's you know um a lot of um maybe spotlight on folks who are sort of either re like resisting the harm of the existing system which is like beautiful but also recognizing that there are people who may feel attuned to create the alternatives um create the new um and so essentially what we tend to do in in our question asking is to invite world building questions um sort of grounded in far enough futures that we're thinking beyond some of the assumptions um of the of the current uh systems or aspects of the current systems that are that are not not serving all of us um and i think one of the invitations as well in our in our work um you know some of the work we do is on on the instagram and in our posts other work we do um involves experience design like designing immersive experiences and so on is to invite people to um practice and embody um the ways of being of of those envisioned future worlds um and to think of ways in which they can not only sort of dream and create something that's gonna happen for future generations, but begin to engage those practices more boldly um, now. So a, um, a lot of it rests in a desire to sort of see people experimenting with what they might find to be the answers to some of those questions um, or replicating what they have experienced in our immersive experiences um, and, and sort of begin to to shift in practical ways, like assumptions about how we are, how we relate to each other, um, how we share. And I'll, I'll share like one quick like experience that I had recently that I did not create, 
but that like moved me and feels like really resonant. Um, there, you know, I'm doing some narrative work right now around like um, sort of reigniting like Pan African unity. And um, I attended this um, sort of a pop up dinner series that was hosted by a woman from Sierra Leone and a, and a young uh, woman from uh, Trinidad and Tobago. And so what they're doing is sort of doing these, these they're creating these collective menus, the two of them, and delighting people with this sort of interplay between their different um, cultures that both, I think, supports like a recognition of what's shared. Um, but it also felt like a really like futuristic experience. Like it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the aesthetics that were futuristic, but it was the the idea of this collaboration, the way that it existed out of um, out of a sort of what I guess might be a typical sort of restaurant environment. Like the chefs and all of the workers seemed really happy. Um, you know, they were interacting. There was a lot of like bringing in of their um, ancestors, like their grandmothers who taught them the recipes and so on. Um, and so the work we're trying to do is, is catalyze more experiences like that, that shift people's assumptions and also help people to um, believe that it's possible because they've experienced it. I don't know at all if I answered the question, but that was how I resonated with it. <laughs> no, I, I think that that does a lot. And I think also um, just powerfully, I think speaking to when you were doing your introduction, you were talking about a desire to be like, well, I'm passionate about all these things. How do I how do I um, have a role to play uh, in creating the overall overall cultural conditions that make all of these things possible? Um, and I think that sort of coalition and collective work that reaches beyond, I think, especially as someone who isn't right operating in the food space, like there can be a lot of walls around that that are unnecessary um, because I think so much of the work you're doing, even though it's not explicitly within food, right? It creates the cultural conditions that make the imagination possible um, so that we can not just in the future, but right now, right? Like be in this immersive experience of the future we long for, the food system we hunger for, the food system that nourishes all of us. And, and with that, I'd love to leave you in Fabiola because I think um, as Aisha was also talking about, um, grounding in sort of intentional narratives and having an immersive experience, thinking about, you know, food is, is so in your body, so immersive, and some of the, the work that you've done with communities, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, yeah, what, um, how sort of grounding in these, these narratives, like you were speaking to around, um, you know, food sovereignty and, and having ownership over production, um, how that can transform our relationships inherently to, to food and, and community. Yeah, thank you for that question. In the spirit of storytelling, I'd like to paint a picture of what it's like to live um, with those values of belonging and mutualism, reciprocity and care here in Oaxaca and more so in indigenous communities. So this month, July, we have, um, it's the month of Gelaguetza is a, is a term. Gelaguetza is a, a indigenous term um, that means reciprocity. And before it became a popular term um, and an event that has become mainly for tourists and a performance for tourists, it is a practice of being in relationship with one another, with our neighbors, with other communities, and um, as a way to, to um, create lifelong bonds with each other. What Gelaguetza looks like is, for example, if um, there is something to celebrate and um, one person cannot buy all the things that that family or that family cannot buy everything that they need to make um, the food to invite guests, their guests will bring some of the food. It's not a potluck. It's, um, for example, me taking um, a, a few pounds, a few kilos, because I'm, I'm here and we go by kilos of corn mm -hmm. that they're gonna use to then um, cook and make tortillas with. And someone else takes sugar for other recipes. And over time, if 
I then have a festivity or something to celebrate, the people that I took those items to will also bring it back. So that's how we re create relationship. But it's not just among people, it's also with the land. How so? Well, with Mezcal, for example, before any kind of big event or celebration or transition, the first person or the first being that gets a sip of that Mezcal is the land. And we pour it on the ground to give thanks because our motto is that anything that comes of the land needs to go back to the land. And we give the land a plate of food. And that is what reciprocity with the land looks like too. Reciprocity with the land also looks like only eating local, only eating seasonal, only eating organic. All these terms that in the United States have become words that consumers like to um, practice with their dollars, but not, as Aisha was saying, embody or practice with each other and with communities. Here in Oaxaca and in indigenous communities, it's an actual practice. So things aren't available year round. And abundance doesn't mean that we're swimming in mezcal and that we're swimming in corn. It means that we eat and we share with each other and it means enoughness. It's very different than the way that we think of abundance in the US that there's just like so much that we, you know, we, we can't even like have, uh, we can't even consume it all in one sitting. Um, for us, it's also sharing with people who don't have um, enough so that they have enough. That's what care looks like. That's what belonging, that's how we create belonging. Um, and there's this other saying um, here that si pueden comer dos, pueden comer tres. So if you, two can eat, three can eat. So whenever we have guests, we always share our food. Like food is so central to connection and so central to community care and community building. I have not been in any other place in the world or I mean, I haven't seen this in the, in the United States where we share a plate of food, even if it's out of our own plate. Um, and I think those are the, the principles and the values that I like for people in the United States specifically to understand why, because we also have a very extractive tourism industry right now, especially in Oaxaca, when like magazines and other media who have messaging around Oaxaca being the culinary heavyweight and other magazines inviting people to come to Oaxaca because of its rich cultural wealth. Um, people are coming here to consume, they're coming here to exploit and to take. And we as giving people, as generous people, as humans who are connected and soulful, open our doors, we open our kitchens, we open our refrigerators, we share what we have. But I don't see that same kind of behavior being expressed or being um, happening in the United States. I'd love to see that, like when can my parents um, or my other relatives, will they ever go to the United States and have people from the United States open their doors, share their culture, share the knowledge, share food? It's actually quite the contrary. There's a lot of anti-immigration sentiment calling us illegals and criminals and um, just having these negative narratives ab about us. So for me, food is also about a larger systems of white supremacy where we, we people of color and indigenous people are othered. Um, and food, I think, is that way to bring us together. And my dad always says, no te iguales, don't be like them, which is continue to be generous, continue to share knowledge, continue to be who you are. And I think that that's what's central in this work is that we just, by, um, create, by feeding like new narratives and the cultures that we want to grow, um, that's the way that we're gonna create that change instead of fighting. And I also know that firsthand because for 15 years I was fighting in the immigrant rights movement and it's always like trying to rebut and it's exhausting. And I think that's why I had to take a pause from that type of movement work because some people's minds and hearts will not change, but I know that there are people's hearts and minds who will change and those are the people to collaborate with. Um, so that's, that's where I'm at with that. I, I love that. And there's so many things that you said that um, are gonna like, I think continue to percolate with me, but I, this specifically the idea of like, what are, in, there's such an act I think of fighting against and thinking about what are we feeding towards? What are we nourishing? That the, the working in food means working in nourishment um, and, and working in cultural nourishment and that the implications of what we do in food nourishes so many things beyond um, and intersected and within, right? Like you can't talk about food without talking about 
immigration in this country. You can't talk about food without talking about blackness, or at least you shouldn't be, right? Um, and and specifically also that when you were talking about to, that we have been taught to practice with dollars, but not with our bodies, and thinking about how that's a cultural assumption, right, around moving towards consumptive solutions. And if we keep driving towards consumptive solutions, like what what are the limits that then that then we reach? Um, but Joe, I'd love to to bring you in specifically with the the food lens. I think um, it's Fabiola and, and Aisha are just two examples, right, of of current practitioners who are doing this in food space and beyond that informs. But I'd I'd love to hear, you know, where are you sort of seeing uh, this intentional narrative work in in food and land and belonging already at play in the food world? Yeah, thank you both, Aisha and, and Fabiola. Um, so so rich what you shared. Um, uh, to your question, Kizue, I think once you once one starts um, regarding food as a cultural medium and and not just uh, nourish you know the physical nourishment um, and uh, seeing food in that way, it becomes obvious that this work is happening all around us as as Fabiola just described, you know, indigenous peoples around the world, um, all of us have indigeneity to somewhere um, in our backgrounds and indigenous people around the world have been living this way for generations, millennia. Um, and um, and there's just a, a flourishing abundance of, of diverse expressions of food as culture and food shaping the world. Um, you know, it, it happens in, in um, land back movement of um, indigenous folks uh, revitalizing cultural traditions in food and land stewardship. It happens in um, pop-up uh, cultural expressions of, of ancestral food um, it happens in um, farms like um, one of the the most um, best known is Soul Food Farm. But there are many, many um, folks around the country who are um, reclaiming, revitalizing these ancestral practices and relationships with food in a way that is uh, relevant to our cultural to our rather to our current context uh, and to building a future where we can all flourish. Um, you know, this world that is shaped by deeper narratives um, like those um, that Austin Conrad identified of the white supremacy narratives in food, you know, our, our food systems, current food systems, dominant food systems are, are so shaped by a logic that um, prioritizes whiteness, that justifies land grabs, that established a violent racial hierarchy. Um, and, and for those of us like myself, whose families um, assimilated into whiteness and, and adopted that logic, um, it, we are particularly can be particularly vulnerable to the the pitfalls of kind of going along um, with those logics, and even when we aren't conscious of it, and um, and so when we intentionally give our attention to and our energy, listen deeply to the folks who are doing this uh, culturally based work, this cultural activation work. Um, we can shed those veils <laughs> um, and reconnect with our own cultural histories and and the diversity of cultures um, that that we each bring and have some connection to, even if um, the the specific expressions were not necessarily passed along to us. So I think I when you're speaking to that, I really hear you know, food as as placemaking, as world building. And I think 
um, dreaming and visioning, we often have this framework of that being almost indulgent or like that that's, that that's not the work, that the work is the hard, like we're advocating. And I think what I'm hearing from you and, and Aisha and, and Fabiola is also like people working in food. This is, um, it's essential to nourish those dreams. Otherwise we're just operating on, on these tasks and within the sort of dreams we've inherited um, that, are, that are not nearly as beautiful and as generous and as um, the guidance that we're looking for. Because I, I think one thing that's coming here powerfully is the idea of, um, I know in, in our work, I've seen this and, and um, spoken to, to folks who've been brought in to share story and, and um, Fabiola, I'm not sure if, if this has been your experience at all either, but I know that myself as a person of color and other folks who get called in sometimes to conversations, it's like, give a story, give a testimony, like we wanna witness your experience, but it's, what if story isn't just perceived as testimony? What if it is truly perceived as navigation? you know, call me in to let me help you lead so that we can all lead collectively. Um, and I think that's so powerful because we move from the story in, in nonprofit worlds, right driven nonprofit worlds, right? Of um, I uh, speak for the voiceless, right? Which is totally everyone has a voice, right? To um, platforming, to amplify, to let me follow the guidance embedded in the stories that you have always been carrying. And I think that is um, such a powerful shift. Um, and I think what we're talking in this theoretic, more abstracted space, and I'd love to also come down to like functionally what this can look like. And um, I'd love to share uh, maybe some glimpses here, but, but to ask particularly of you like Aisha and, and Fabiola, um, how, you know, thinking about the narratives that drive your work, the values that drive your work, how have you created these, um, you know, embodied experiences of them? And, and maybe if you can talk to an example in particular, and before I um, pass it pass it off to you, Erin, um, I'm hoping you can pull up those slides just to give people a glimpse. I know Aisha was um, mentioning some of the immersive um, interactions. Um, so here's just a glimpse of that. You can move to the next slide. And Fabiola speaking to some of the mezcal education, storytelling, immersive moments. And then the last slide, what we've been using as well, Joe, maybe you can share a bit on um, some of the immersive or experiential based work that um, we've been doing at Food Culture Collective um, that also takes that. Thanks, Erin, you can close that down. So maybe I'll kick it um, to you first. Fabiola about um, maybe talking us through an example of how you've created an experience rooted in um, the narrative or story that you're you're cultivating. Yeah, thank you for that. The word that comes to mind is responsibility. As you may recall from my earlier introduction, I said that I've ignored doing this work multiple times. And I think it was that third time that I was like, okay, no one else is doing this work. It feels like a responsibility. And um, to me, that means being of service because that's how I, that's what I've seen modeled by my, by my family and my relatives is that we're of service to each other. And that is how traditionally we have made the work happen. That is how what we have uh, fed each other. Um, as I mentioned in the, another example of sharing food and sharing corn or other um, ingredients to create food, um, that is exactly how uh, you know we used to operate with each other. It wasn't um, I'll pay you X amount of dollars if you come and help me um, degrain the corn for X hours. It's come and help me, and you can take some. That's what reciprocity looks like, right? And so, in that same spirit, for me, that's the responsibility of like, okay. So I was fortunate enough to get a higher education, get my master's degree. Um, yes, in spite of being undocumented throughout all that time. And what I learned in my work um, as a public health practitioner doing community-based participatory research is that even as somebody who has lived experiences as an undocumented woman of color um, and have experienced my own discriminations, it also means that I'm aware of other ways that I can also perpetuate um, elitism or knowing better than because I have those degrees and those credentials. Um, but in my research, what I have learned is that people who are most impacted by uh, issues also have those solutions. 
and in an effort to not repeat the saviorism complex, um, one, that's one of the reasons why I expanded the Miwahaka project to include uh, cultural education and mascot education and by extension, preservation, uh, uh, cultural preservation. What that looks like, that, what that has looked like is uh, having private mezcal events and food events. Not currently, of course, because I'm not there, though I do also have mezcal education events here that are private. Um, and why I do it privately is because um, that's, I wanna be able to connect with the people who are seeking that knowledge specifically, because it's more important to me that I have a depth of connection than to have a wide reach. And I think the people who experience the mezcal uh, uh, tastings come out with a lot of knowledge and um, also a lot of reflection, which I think is really necessary for this work. And that does have to get expanded. So uh, one thing that I'm working on right now is working with a small team to create a more robust and um, a clear, a clear mezcal and food education program. But, in, but before just like diving in and creating those programs, I'm also taking a step back and including the voices of people who actually live here and have had to rely on the mezcal industry to make a living. Unfortunately, because the mezcal industry is growing pretty quickly in the United States and across the globe, it also means that there's a hierarchy that's being created here. There are already like celebrity mezcal, uh, mezcal uh, maestros mezcaleros is, is, is the term. So like master distillers and they're getting, they're getting celebritized. And that in itself is also part of the culture that I'm, I, I want to uh, move away from because that, that's, the hi that's what creates hierarchy and that's what creates a scarcity mindset, right? Um, so um, I'll be embarking on a community-based participatory research project here in Oaxaca. That's why I'm here um, at the beginning of the year and um, getting youth involved to uh, live here because my town, as I mentioned, is the world capital of mezcal. We make mezcal for the largest um, U.S. brands. They're not producer-owned. They're owned by foreigners. You can find that mes those mezcales at Trader Joe's, at Whole Foods. So if you get that, just know that it's probably homogenized and it's actually not traditional. Not all of them, but most of them. Um, and it's really mind boggling that even though we produce for the largest brands, there's not a, a high school in our town. There is no, um, a, there's no water, w there's like water scarcity. Um, we don't have like water is communal and yet most of it is going for mezcal production. Um, we also don't have a waste management system. So because there is waste that is produced from creating mezcal, um, it gets dumped on the soil and in these arroyos. And that's obviously damaging the water plates. No one's really talking about this or if they talk about it, it's just to like uh, pay lip service and to mention it, but it's there is no action steps behind that. And so part of the work is to be um, in conversation with youth and people who live here to also like uncover some of those solutions um, while also creating a program that um, preserves the culture. And, and, a bunch and of I think what you're saying that, <laughs> and I think what you're saying there, Fabiola, which I think is so powerful is this idea of people might see the work that you're doing and say, oh great, it's about, you know, cultural preservation, it's about mezcal, it's about conics, but that it's about um, sovereignty, it's about power shifting, it's about um, having ripple effects that are go so beyond and deeper than maybe what the box is put in of what the impact. And I think being witnessed in the fullness of the impact of your work and thus the possibility of its impact is how we start to move there. Because I think there's been so much of a, a boxing there. And I know um, we're, we're starting to run up against time, but I'd love Aisha to weave you in and, and just get an, an um, pose the same question of, you know, maybe speaking to one example of how you've created experiences for people to immerse in um, these narratives you're working to cultivate and, and kind of expand their imaginations of, of what's possible. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, the one that comes most easily to mind, or the one we've done most recently, we collaborated with the social impact department at Carnegie Hall 
during their Afrofuturism festival to essentially build a world, a future world called Afrocosmic Melotopia that was um, imagined, conceptualized, and then we facilitated the world building of by about 25 young people um, who participate in programs that, that um, work with people who are impacted by the carceral state. So they spent about five hours sort of imagining this future world um, in which, um, you know, all people, um, but censoring people of African descent are um, liberated and included and empowered. And so we sort of built out like, what are the aesthetics of that world? Like, what does it feel like? What are people eating, smelling, feeling, wearing? What is the climate, the landscape, all of it, you know? And then we translated that world build into um, transforming a wing of, of Carnegie Hall um, into an, a, an experience of that world. And we had to create a story around like, well, how are people experiencing the world? And our story was that guests who are attending this experience have sort of left earth and ended up in, in this world. And so as they enter, they, we sort of imagined like, well, how do you enter a world that's, that is operating according to values of, of belonging and welcoming. And so, you know, for folks, I don't know, for folks who have passed through the US immigration system and, you know, not necessarily with all the privileges of the people for whom that system is, is designed, it can feel really daunting to like enter the United States. Like, you know, the, and it's subtle, like the lines, the colors, the lack of windows, everything, you feel scary. And if they bring those dogs through and you're on the wrong plane and the wrong color, and you get taken to a room, it's a scary, it can be a scary experience. So we were like, okay, how do we design an experience for entering this world that embodies like those values? And so we created like a welcoming garden and people sort of move through and they learn about the ancestors, um, all the people who shaped that world. And then they move into a marketplace where they can interact with all of the ideas. And we curated a lot of um, art from, from young people in the programs, as well as from other artists who specialize in um, extended and alternative reality art. Um, and then people sort of proceeded into a dance party that was um, meant to be a ritual of collective joy within the ethos of this world um, that had like, you know, some of the most popular DJs, DJ MoMA, <laughs> people, I don't know if people know him, from everyday people. It's one of the popular sort of um, kind of Afrobeat, um, soca, reggae, dance hall, hip hop parties. Um, that's growing globally, um, DJ and DJ Reborn, who's Lauren Hill's DJ. And then we created a menu and we had to work with Carnegie Hall's is catering to create like an Afrofuturist menu, which they've never done before in their lives, like to serve plantain and guacamole and, um, you know, sorrel or Jamaica and like jollof rice. And they had to go figure out how to do it. And I think um, the experience like for the people who attended they could never have imagined that they could be in Carnegie Hall because that's not the reputation of Carnegie Hall at all. So to just be able to be there and feel so affirmed, um, both in their reality as well as in this idea of a future, um, people were just like overwhelmed. And then for the staff of Carnegie Hall, they had to sort of grapple with this process of transforming Carnegie Hall into a, a place that centers Black joy, which they have never done before. Um, and everything from the menu to the decor to like, you know, the kind of art and so on and whether they can move them, they had to remove portraits of founders because we were like not gonna have any Carnegie Hall like founders and donors up during our event. Um, yeah, so that was just like a really beautiful experience. We had about 300 people attend, mostly due to the DJs because <laughs> they're super popular DJs. Um, and I think it shifted a lot of assumptions for the hall and for attendees around who it, who that place can belong to um, and what how the hall can be in relationship to people of African descent um, in, in New York City. I love hearing in that how sort of the embedded call of um, how can we be host to radical imaginations that we don't necessarily can't feed ourselves? How do we create spaces that um, nourish them and resource them and um, I'd love to, I'm gonna shift it a little bit um, since I know where we are at time, uh, Jovita, in, in weaving you in here, but I think those two examples are such a clear expression of narrative strategy 
as um, I think in some spaces you can really hear narrative strategy as, as uh, another model of um, disseminating content and moving things for people to continue to consume. I saw in the chat, someone lifting up like, yes, why do we have to continue to think of people just as consumers? Um, and I'd love maybe, you know, that's also part of the assumption of narrative strategy being just like, is it just another form of strategic messaging? Like, are you just like, is it just about telling messages that we're supposed to then like, um, you know, like another thing to consume and then, and then practice maybe through consumptive pathways? And I'd love to maybe hear a little bit about um, how you've approached in the work that, that stewarding with uh, our team at Food Culture Collective, like moving from consumption as a pathway to change to practice as a pathway to change and maybe how that moves us from, from messaging into action that we can all be part of. Thanks, Chizue. And, and I'm actually gonna shift it and offer a practice and invite folks to practice together. Um, so as, as Aisha named earlier, some of the um, kind of cultural technologies that allow us to tap into creativity and, and claim our power to create the world, to shape the world, um, include embodiment and uh, meditation, and, and I'm gonna add visioning. Um, so I wanna invite you in whatever space you're in to um, connect with a current sensation that feels easeful, maybe even possibly pleasurable. It might be something visual in your in the space you're in. It might be just the simple rhythm of your breath, just tuning into your own sensation. And start to notice the pattern of your breath, where you feel your breath, where you feel ease in your breath. and maybe intentionally bringing awareness of your belly, moving with your breath. And now call to mind a child you know. It might be someone dear to you. It might be someone you just see regularly in your neighborhood. And imagine that child growing into an adult and, and parenting themselves, becoming meaning parenting a new generation. And imagine that next generation <clears throat> then growing into the future and parenting a generation forward. And, you know, as, as these generations are passing, that the cultural work to recenter and activate values of mutualism, belonging, and reciprocity has grown and flourished because more and more people are putting their attention there and intentionally shaping their actions, their everyday actions, and their big scale actions around those values. And so another generation passes, those values are flourishing, and another generation passes. And that generation, imagine, is living in a world shaped by care for land, waters, and people. coming. Drink in that world. Imagine the, that perspective of that future child living in that world. And with that future perspective, describe to yourself, because we all belong to the land, now in this world, what is true? And I invite you 
as you are ready to reconnect with your sensation in the current moment, any aspect of ease or pleasure in your current sensation. And come back to, as you are ready, the eyes opening, coming back to our shared conversation. And if you feel moved to drop in the chat, how you would finish that sentence from that future perspective. I know this was was a pretty fast visit to a vision of, of the future, um, but if anything arose for you, we'd love to hear it. And then also, um, you know, time is passing. <laughs> and, and as you are sharing in the chat, want to invite um, Megan and Maggie to um, share uh, why, why did you bring us here today? Thanks so much. Um, and just want to say quickly, thank you to all of the speakers today, the wonderful speakers and um, and to you all from Food Culture Collective um, and SAFSF for putting this amazing conversation together. Um, I'll, I'll speak really quickly because we want to get to some questions. And if you have them, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, but, you know, we brought this uh, forward to SAFSF because we really believe that storytelling and narrative strategy are, um, are really important tools in shifting public opinions and, uh, and policy. And as the, uh, the speakers talked about really beautifully today, um, it's also really important to create these new positive, um, forward thinking, beautiful narratives. Um, so narratives about what, what is possible um, as we shift our thinking about food systems. Um, we at Grace, we believe that, um, you know, that funders can and really should recognize and lift up the power of communications. We've seen that today. We've seen the, the power of story um, and the power of communicators. Um, and really, we can support our partners in this work and recognize that, um, that communications work and, and narrative strategy work and storytelling work um, is not, you know, just an add on to um you know to, to programmatic work but it really is uh, integral to the work that we are all doing um in food systems change um i think it's also really important especially for us as funders always thinking about power dynamics um to remember that um inherent and successful narrative shifts is also um you know the shifting of power so we have to you know examine that and and know that we're not only changing the dominant narratives here about food systems, but we're, we're shifting power as well. And to understand that um, these, these narratives that are out there, these dominant narratives now um, that exist about food systems and food, um, they, they're not neutral. They, they were created by powerful players um, like big, big corporations and those who profit from them and are um, you know, undergirded by white supremacy. Um, Maggie, do you want to share some um, some examples, some active examples of how communications and um, and narrative work is being funded right now at SAFSF? Yes, thanks, Megan, uh, for the introduction, and thanks to all for facilitating such a wonderful, vulnerable, um, thought provoking presentation today. Two quick examples of how funders have invested in communications work at SAFSF is through my position as communications director. Funding capacity is really important. And that capacity for us has created space for us to think through webinars like this one and to think deeper about our own organizational communication strategy. And then another example is our film project we're currently working on that will explain SAFSF's focus areas, concentration and consolidation, climate change and land access. This film series is a platform we are inviting people who are most impacted by those issues to tell their stories and educate us and the greater sector of philanthropy about what those issues look like on the ground and what solutions and ways philanthropy and funders can plug in um, to help solve those issues and how policy work is embedded in each of those and how we can use our power to do that as well. Um, I'll leave you with this. I believe that we are only as good as the stories we tell or amplify. 
So what stories are you holding that need to be told or in what ways can you help someone tell their own story? Erin is gonna drop some links into the chat about our focus areas and film trailer. Please reach out if y'all have more questions about that work that we're doing and I'll kick it back to Megan for Q&A. We are almost out of time. We've got about two minutes left. Um, if anyone has any burning questions, you can either drop it uh, drop them in the chat and I'm happy to read them out loud or um, feel free to unmute and just ask. Um, otherwise, you know, we're always here for follow-ups. If you have questions that come to you, I know I'm the kind of person that likes to kind of ruminate on things. So if you're the same, um, feel free to follow up afterwards. But any questions now, we've got some time, a couple minutes. And uh, as Aaron says, as a reminder, um, the slides will be shared as well after this. Anything? Okay. If if there are not, oh, go ahead, Shizue. <laughs> I was going to say if there if there aren't questions, I would love to invite folks um, in this final minute um, to maybe think about one word or phrase or question that has stuck with you in this conversation um, or that has sparked for you and um to share that in the chat i think um something is yeah as simple as a single word i know one thing that um is is going to sit with me um after this conversation is just the call to um move from from consumption into an embodied practice from from money to body um and that's that's one thing that i'm going to be be carrying forward but um, it's been really wonderful to share this time with all of you. Thank you for offering us um, this moment um, to converse with people that we find interesting and dynamic and powerful. And I hope that there are more opportunities for us all to be in conversation around um, the powerful stories that um, can drive our future and create the reality that we long for and hunger for and deserve right now. I'll just read off a couple mm -hmm. as we are, are hanging out. We see gratitude, working in food is working in nourishment, story is navigation, faith, hope, reciprocity. I think it's a powerful thing in food to ground in these and feel collectively nourished. Um, so instead of burning out, we burn up in positive, um, sparking, exciting dynamic stories of who we can become in the end to help you lead. Thank you all for sharing this time. And like we said, the slides will be shared along with our contact information. Um, if you have any desire to follow up with questions um, or conversation. Thank you everyone.